Okay. This is actually our last workup workshops for the fall. So I'm glad you guys caught us. Uh, we will be continuing to offer these in the spring. Um, they will be offered on mo in Mondays for the spring for the spring semester. Um, and so this workshop assumes basic familiar familiarity with R. We'll work on wrangling the data through R and through R packages. Um, we recommend that if R is a skill you're trying to build, that you come back to this as you learn R because things connect um, the deeper you get into it. And while it might seem like a foreign language now, down the road, this might make a lot more sense. And so throughout this workshop, we will have something called sandboxes. These are where you're going to run mini challenges. You can reset always reset it back and you can view the solution, but we always encourage you to kind of work through it on your own and give it your best shot. Um, but this allows you to work with the code in a very small chunk um, and just allows you to play around with it. So we'll have different challenges for you throughout the workshop to help you kind of actually type out the code and play around with it. Um, and so yeah, our learning objectives are to learn about the Dippler and the Tidy R packages and go through and use different commands in those packages to make our data usable for analysis. And then in the end, we're going to end up with hopefully a nice file for you to take home and look back on. Um, and you can learn. So yeah. So we're not necessarily manipulating the data here. We are going through our data and in a very reproducible fashion, um, changing it to be more usable for analysis. Um, so we're not necessarily taking out or adding anything, but we are more reformatting it. And it will, you'll be able to see, like if you go to someone else's data, you'll be able to very clearly see the work they did to do this. Um, so packages in R allow you to do different things. We have installed the tidyverse package, or we will install the tidyverse package, which is umbrella package with things for, for with different packages for analysis, wrangling, visualization, and things like that. So tidyverse uh, is the tidyverse package tries to address three common issues that arises with the typical R base package. Um, this is that it handles data variety better. So sometimes when you put in or sorry, quantitative data, it will read it as categorical data. So tidyverse has a little bit more um, knowledge when it comes to that when importing. Tidyverse also uses really consistent code, which makes it easier for learners. Um, you don't see a lot of variation, and there's typically just a few ways to do things. And then base R sometimes has hidden arguments within its code, things that you won't see, things going on behind the scene. And this can add an extra layer of complexity, especially if you're new to data science. So Tidyverse tends to show them, and this can help with learning a lot. And so to help with this um, misinterpretation of quantitative values as categorical values, we're gonna set string of factors equal to false. Um, so this will this will make R not convert quantitative data to what we call factor data types, which is basically categorical data. And then to invert or to install the tidyverse package, which may already be done in your R, you're just going to go library tidyverse. And that's going to bring down that entire umbrella package. Dippler and tidy R are packages within tidyverse. Dippler works to build data frames and is used more for analysis and is run off C++. Um, it doesn't use a lot of R storage because it works with external databases and it only really brings in the results of your code, which is nice. Tidy R is more used for reshaping data analysis and visualization. Um, and, and is used for more selecting data and these are, sorry, these are handout sheets 
with uh, cheats for Diplar and PyER just to help. And to present the data, um, or sorry, the data we are using for this workshop is small mammal communities in southern Arizona. This has a combination of categorical and quantitative data, um, so we will have to tackle that. And the best way to import that when you have a mix of the data is read underscore CSV um, instead of read dot CSV. So you'll say surveys, assign read CSV, and insert the data workshop or the sorry the data set. Um, and then this is going to give you a brief summarization of your of your data, including how many rows, how many columns, the types of your data. So we have two categorical and seven quantitative. Um, and then if we want to see just a preview of our data, we can go glimpse surveys, and that will give us just a very brief overview of just the first few sets of our data so we can kind of see it without fully having it displayed. Um, if we do want to fully display it, we can make something called a table. This is done by doing view surveys, and this only allows the amount of columns that can fit on your screen. So it makes it a lot more easily visual and less cluttered, um, but sometimes cannot show all the data. As you can see, it has 100 pages, so um, doesn't really give you a full glimpse, but does ring all the data just up and about. And these are different functions within Dippler um, that we'll be using within our code to select columns, rows, and various other things. So yeah, that is an intro to the workshop. Okay, so the next thing we'll talk about is starting to do some of this wrangling with the data that we have. So I'm going to talk through a few simple ways to select, filter, and mutate your data. Um, so to select columns, use the select function, and the first argument has to be the data set that you have, which for us is called surveys. So we're selecting from surveys. Let's say we want to just see plot ID, species ID, and weight. So this select function will just display these, select these for you, but it's not changing the data set in any way. It's just showing you these three columns. So you can do that, you do surveys, and then just whatever comes after that first column, you separate with columns and choose whichever columns you like, or sorry, with commas and choose whichever columns you like. Then you can also use the minus sign to um, not show certain columns. So in this next um, command, we're saying select surveys, but not record ID, not species ID. So then you can see here below, we have all of the columns except those two. But then I think this is meant to show us, if we use this names function, this is meant to show us that actually all of the columns are still present in the data set. We're just viewing that this selected amount of columns. Um, then you, you can also use filter to um, select columns based on certain criteria. So, um, for in, so instead of saying we only want the column year, we can say we only want any rows where the year is 1999. So use that double equals sign to filter out by just 1999. So you can see here, I still have a lot of rows, but all of them are 1999. Um, then a few other options are listed here. You can use exclamation point equals, which is not equal to. You can use comma, which means and, or this, I guess we call it a pipe. There's something else called a pipe in R, but this vertical bar, vertical bar which means or. And you can also do greater than or less than, or less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. Um, so in this one, we're saying, okay, let's filter these surveys again, but this time let's make it so the, the year isn't 1999. So if you run that, you'll see, okay, we've got 1996. We have, oh, lots of 96. Let's see what's over here. Oh. I feel like there are some 2000s in there, but in any case, let's see if we can find that. 
just to prove me right, there are 2000s in there. Okay, there we are, a few, a few years, 2000. Um, then we're giving an example here using the comma to mean or. So we have, we filter the surveys and let's say the year is 19, we want the year to be 1999 and we want the plot ID to be two. So we're looking only at data that was collected in plot two in the year 1999. I think this has an error in the code to show us. Oh, nope, it doesn't. Okay, so we said, and what I actually don't think we talked about the ampersand here. Because we used this vertical bar instead to mean. And. So, and would be equivalent to a comma. Okay, I see. So, we could also, whoops, Nancy, we could use the comma there to. Okay, so this is showing us that you can use comma or you can use an ampersand to mean both, but you could also, yep, this below. So this is keeping everything where the year is 1999 and the plot ID is two, or you could say, I want things collected in 1999 or with a plot ID of two. So you can see here that is giving you, okay, there, here's, data collected in plot ID 2, but it was collected in 1996. And then it'll also show things collected in 1999 that were not in plot 2. There's a lot of data here. Here we go. So for instance, it's some of the data collected from plot 1 in the year 1999. So these are just ways to sort of look at your data and filter it in different ways. Here's another example. I'm kind of going to rush through these because we have limited time, but you can say, where's the weight less than 8? Where's the hind foot length of greater than 30? So different ways to view your data and understand it. Then let's talk about types. So this is a useful function that likes that simplifies your code in R. So or not function, but what would it be called? Operator? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so here's an example of a way to work through to create a smaller data set. Let's call it surveys two. And adding, putting into this new variable of surveys or new um, object of surveys two, we're going to filter our original surveys data and just find data where the weight of these rodents was less than six. So first we do that, okay, and then let's do it again. We want it to be even smaller, so we're just going to select from this new small um, data set of weights less than six. Um, just the species ID, the sex, and the weight of these animals that weigh less than six. And then let's print out this new small data set. Okay, that's one way to do it. And this is readable, but it can sort of clutter up your workspace um, that you have to like do each of these steps individual, individually, and it can be a little harder to keep track of your steps. So here's another example of what you could do. You could nest your um, commands. So like create the survey small, and that is you select and you filter and there's surveys and it's weight less than six and all of these ideas, but it can be a little complicated with nesting parentheses to figure out where you put each thing, make sure that you have each of the parentheses right. We're still getting, this is kind of an example of how you can use a lot of different strategies to get the same result in R, but um, so we're showing you this way, this way, and then maybe our preferred way is to use a pipe, which really simplifies the code. So pipes are this little symbol here. It's like a percent sign greater than sign and a percent, another percent sign. And a shortcut is to say control shift shift M or command shift M if you have a Mac. But pipes let you take the output of one function and then pipe it directly into a new function. Um, so here's an example. We have our original data set surveys and we're piping it. And another way to, you can think about this is saying, first you have surveys and then you filter surveys to only include data weights that were less than six. And then pipe, you select from that data only the column species ID, sex, and weight. So this is just like a very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Elegant way 
to display the data and it makes it really clear what's happening. It's just these three steps. Um, there you go. So let's, if we want to create a new object, we can still do that. So in these codes above, we ended up creating a new object called surveys underscore small. So you can still do that by taking this argument, this whole piece of code here and saying survey small and um, assigning survey small all of this. So you can see there we're ending up with it again. Um, okay, here's a little challenge. Using pipes, subset the survey's data to include animals collected on or after 2001, in or after 2001, and then also retain only the columns year, sex, and weight. So we actually have the answer here. So you can see, starting with the original data survey, then you want to filter it so that the year is greater than or equal to 2001. So in 2001 or after, and then you want to just select these three columns to end up with this new data frame. And yeah, if you want to create, this is just a view basically, but if you want to create a new object called survey after 2001, that's a long title, but then you could do that as well. And then you could, whoops, I spelled that. And then you could use this as to create, to wrangle additional data. Okay, next is the mutate. Any questions on that? The pipe? Okay. Uh, so mutate is another function we'll use. You might want to create new columns based on the values of existing columns that you have. Um, so for that, you'll use mutate. So here we're using pipes as well. So we take surveys and then we want to mutate them so that we're adding a new column called weight kilogram and that column is going to be made up of the weight column divided by a thousand because i think the original weight i'm not sure what the um measure of the original weight is but it must be grams grams <laughs> yes <laughs> uh so here we have so in kilograms it's 0.007 just another way to like take the data from one column and create a new column based on that data. Um, we can also create a second column if we wanna do weight in pounds. So we can um, use the mutate function and do multiple um, pieces of computation within there. So, okay, let's make a weight kilogram, which we divide the grams by a thousand. And then let's also make a weight in pounds where we multiply the kilograms by 2.2. So there we have that. And here's an example of how in this tutorial, if your columns go too far, you can um, slide over and see the rest of what's there. Oh, okay. And then here's showing you um, using the head command or function. If you want to look at just the first hmm, six rows is what head does. So this just simplifies your view so that you're not using all this computing power to look at all 100 rows when maybe you just want to make sure that your new weight column came in correctly, which it looks like it did. Um, and then it looks like we have a few NAs here. And for our purposes, maybe we just want to remove any um, observations that have an NA to simplify our computation. So if there were missing values here, we could use filter to um, filter those out. So surveys, looking at the surveys data and then using the pipe, you filter anything in the weight column that is not, that's what the exclamation point means, is NA. So let's just do that at first. Then you can see there's no longer any NAs in this row, this weight row. Then we can, from there, use our mutate function to add the new column where we create kilograms and then also look at this first six rows. 
So yeah, the is.na function, it determines whether something is NA. So you can use that to identify, oops, sorry, the um, everything that has an NA in it, or you can use it as we did just now to filter out filter out the NAs by using the exclamation point NA, or exclamation point is dot NA to filter out anything and leave everything that is not in NA. Making sense? Okay. Uh, so for challenge two, let's create a new data frame called surveys hind foot centimeter that meets the following criteria. Is this filled in in yours as well, or do you have a blank screen? Yeah, it's just okay, that sweet. Computer remembered from the last time and we didn't hit start. Oh, okay. I'm going to hit start over just for our future. <laughs> okay. Okay, so here's the challenge. So let's just take two minutes to try this because I feel like this is a good challenge. Okay, I'm going to come back here. So we have a new object called surveys underscore hind foot underscore centimeters. And we take surveys and then we use mutate to add a new column that's the hind foot in centimeters. And since the hind foot length is in millimeters, we divide that number by 10 to get centimeters. And then we filter that new um, data set, data frame, so that the hind foot in, oops, hind foot in centimeter is less than three, and, or you could use the comma, um, use this exclamation point is dot NA to remove the NAs from this hind foot centimeters column, and then you select just the column species ID and hind foot underscore centimeters, and then we've added this head, um, function to show just the first six rows. So here we have it, yay. <laughs> I think it would be nice actually to see the hind foot length original too. There we go, cool. 
how'd that go? Good. I got <laughs> the head part. <laughs> I mean, you don't have to use the head part. You could also just look at it by saying view, right? Surveys. Or actually, let's figure that out. It's capital B. That's oh, thank you. <laughs> But um, that doesn't work. That only works in our studio. So oh, gotcha. Okay. The sandbox is you just do the. That. Oh, or you could just type it out. Yeah, there you go, and that shows you the entire data frame. Okay. Next, we have using Lubridate for dates. Greta's gonna help me with this one, or are you gonna come in, Sally? Okay, we'll do this. One. Okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> awesome. So, uh, think selector, select, filter, and mutate cover a lot of what you can do with data wrangling. Um, so, Lubridate is a um, Ivyverse package that deals with dates. So, dates is something you often encounter in your data sets, um, and they're really frustrating to work with. Uh, there's different types of formats and um, time zones and leap days, things like that. Um, so they get really frustrating to work with. Um, Lubrid Lubr Date helps with that. Um, it has a ton of different functions that make things simple with dates. Um, so um, the, this uh, YMD, DMY, MDY, these are basic functions that you can enter a text string of a date in that format, your month, day, or whichever variation uh, to create a date. Um, so uh, we can just take a look at the package here, Lubridate um, and load that. And then if you use the function today or now, it'll tell you, um, it'll just, you don't need any uh, uh, arguments in there and it'll just tell you today's date or right now includes the time. And you'll notice that these are text strings, so it's got the quotations around it, and the default format is year, month, day. Um, and then we can sort of deal with the dates in our surveys data set using this package. So um, we'll just take a look at... So we've got surveys and then we want to mutate. So create a new variable called date. Um, and we're going to give it a year, month, day format date. Um, and since the surveys data set has a year, month and day variable, which are numeric, we're going to paste all those together separated by a hyphen. Um, and that will create our text string that looks like this. Uh, and it'll do that for the entire data set because we're creating this mutate variable. Um, and then we're also going to create a second variable called day of week, um, which since we already have this date now created, we're taking that and using the wday function from Lubridate to tell us the day of the week. So when we perform all of those, we get, um, well, it tells us some information. There's a warning, which we'll come back to. Um, but what we have here is our whole data set. Uh, so we save that as an object. And we have our new date and day of week variables. So here's that. And you can see um, the, the type of variable is a date. And then day of week is uh, ordinal. And it lists Saturday for, uh, these are all January 27th. Uh, it calculates that automatically. Um, and then if uh, we can use head, uh, this does the same thing for six rows of that data. Um, scroll over. And then uh, we can pipe in the summary function. So we take our new data set with date we're selecting just the day of the week variable, and we want to do summary to take a look at that. And that gives us a summary of the different days of week that were calculated with this wday function. So um, we've got 4,000 of Sunday, Saturday, 
there's Wednesday, Monday, Thursday, other and NAs. So you might notice this doesn't maybe look right. Um, and then we can go back to there. There was a warning when we created this. Maybe we can do that again. So the warning we got when we performed this was 125 failed to parse. So let's try and figure out what went wrong here. It kind of worked. Um, so summary, there's 125. So maybe the failed to parse had to do with that. Those were NAs. Um, but then there's also other, and there's some days of the week missing. Um, so we can use this table function um, to look at month and day, which we're used to create the dates. Um, and we're also going to filter out the, the NAs or no, we're only looking at the NAs. We want to see what's going on there. And then we're looking at the month and day to see what happened um, that they ended up as NA or other. So create a table. And this is just the counts of um, for month four and nine, there were days labeled as 31. So 70 of those and 55 of those. And maybe you can figure out what the problem is there. <laughs> uh, there's no 31st of April or September. Um, so if we go back to this and before we feed this into the table, this is the data that we've made that table from, but yeah, there's a bunch of 431 and 931. So those didn't get calculated correctly when you try to find the day of the week or the date. Um, so that's what this challenge is saying, how go in and look at what's happening there. Um, so it's important to inspect your data and warnings that happen, um, which you uncover problems with data entry. Um, so yeah, with dates, there's um, some other useful functions like year, month, um, M day, hour, minute, second, and you can put a date into these functions and it'll just give you the year. So you can put the whole date in and it'll give you, you know, maybe it was 2001 and it'll just pull out that part of it for you. Uh, so those are useful. Um, so that's creating and looking at dates. Um, we'll jump to the next thing, which uh, this is related. So character wrangling dates, you end up using a lot of character strings for formatting. Um, but a lot of times in data sets, there's a lot of different character variables that you might have, not just numbers. So uh, those can also be tricky to work with. So there's a lot of good packages in the tidyverse umbrella package that help. Um, so um, we'll look at case when and this challenge for us saying, what are the names of the days of the week? So we're going to try and format the names of the days of the week. So um, I don't remember, I'm going to look at the solution because I don't remember the data set name. Uh, so we save this all in surveys W days. So that's where we had our variables that we made. Um, and then we can do this a couple of different ways and the sort of easy base our way. We have our data set and we want to look at day of the week. And then um, if you remember, those were an ordinal variable. So we can look at the levels. Uh, is it left? Oops. Uh, so the unique categories of that variable were Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That looks good. Um, but maybe we want to change those into the full day of the week. Maybe we're using in a plot or a table or something else. So we want to modify these. So that's where case when comes in. So um, it's sort of like a repetitive if else statement. So you can take each of these cases and say, if the category for that observation was Sunday, then uh, whatever you wanna name it. So um, we take that data set and mutate day of week. So we're changing day of week. And then we have our case when function 
and the input for case one, you need to know what variable you're looking at. So uh, day of week, and we're just saving it over the top of itself, which is why these are the same. Um, so day of week, whenever that is equal to mon, we want to rename it as Monday and then comma, and then just go to the, the next one. And if it's uh, two, we want to name it Tuesday and so on for all of those. And then we will just use glimpse to take a look at the data set. So glimpse is telling us this is another way to look at uh, what's contained in this day of week variable. So we now see that day of week is a character variable and the first values are Saturday, 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 Saturday. Uh, so that's maybe not, we can't see all the changes we made. So we maybe we'll look at that a different way. That's maybe next. Um, another way we can go back. Uh, so if we, if we try levels like we did before, we'll see that we'll run into a problem. So this is what we did before, before to look at all of them. Uh, but the output we get for that is null, and it's because this is now a character variable and not categorical like ordinal or uh, factor. Uh, so I think I can just do table. And now it counts the unique values, even though um, it, it's not a factor variable or categorical. So yeah, now the categories are Friday, Monday, Saturday, Sunday, Thursday. So those look good. It looks like our change stuck. So, um, so case when you also don't have to specify all of everything in your data set. Um, you can just pick out some of them. Uh, so here we're doing the same thing. We're creating a weekday variable and we're changing Saturday into a zero, Sunday into a zero, Friday into an NA and everything else into a one. Um, so it's basically saying, uh, zero if the weekend, one if the weekday, and Friday is nothing. And then uh, run that. Okay, and then we'll just take a quick look at the. Um. Well, I'll just run the whole thing. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to just look at the data set so that we can see what this variable looked like, but count makes a summary of this variable um, and we can see the unique values in there. So count is another way to kind of look at what we're looking at here. Um, so for weekday, we have, there's values of zero, one and an A and it gives you the counts of each of those. Um, and going back, you might have noticed that when we change these names, they're now in a not great order. The first one is Friday and then Monday and then Saturday. So this is a uh, alphabetical order, uh, sort of ours default. So maybe we want to change those into a better order. Um, and we also looked at what type of data it is now. Um, that was, let's see. Let's forget the data set name. So that's the data set, and then day of week, and the class of that is it's a character variable, so that's challenge five is what type of data is it now? Um, and we saw that they're in a different order than maybe we started with, alphabetical order. Um, so another package, um, it's a sub package of the tidyverse again. So for cats, this has a lot of useful functions for this type of thing. Uh, we can change the order of those levels Instead of being alphabetical, we'll use um, uh, this factor relevel function to change the order really easily. Um, so to do that, we just 
have our original data set and then uh, with the pipe function and then mutate and then change day of week. Uh, so our new version day of week equals a re-leveled version of day of week. So uh, factor re-level takes the variable that you're interested in and then you just type out um, in order uh, the different levels that are there, but you put them in the order that you want. So we've got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and those are all separated by a comma. And then um, we'll run that and look at glimpse. And we can now see that it is a factor variable. It's um, that's what this factor relevel takes care of turning it into a factor. And then there's seven levels starting with Monday, Tuesday, doesn't tell us all of them. So um, we can go back again and do either count or table or levels because now it's a factor. Uh, and we can see that it's in a better order, the one we specified here. Okay. Uh, challenge six, verify that our, put it in the order that you specified. I guess we just did that. Um, so there's several different ways to do it. So try out a few of them. Maybe easier to remember than others. Okay. Um, so that's a lot of the factor variables that you have to deal with a lot in data wrangling. Um, you're not always going to have numbers. So, um, all right. So we'll go on to the next section. Um, so this is sort of moving on from dealing with um, changing the variables and the values themselves to creating summaries. So you have your whole data set that you've been formatting, and now you want to find summary information from the entire data set. Um, so we can do that with group by and summarize, and this sort of takes the approach of this split, apply, combine. So you're splitting the data set into groups from a certain variable, um, and to each of those groups, you're going to have a summary measure, and then um, the combine is that you get the summaries of each group together. Um, so that's what that means. And so we do that with your data set uh, piped into group by. So you use group by to select sort of your subgroups that you want to apply the summaries to. So um, yeah, a categorical, usually a categorical or a character variable. So um, something defining groups. So we are doing sex here. And then we're going to use summarize to find some kind of summary measure for each of the different levels of sex. So um, we're going to call our summary variable um, or summary measure mean weight. And then we're using the function mean to calculate the mean on the weight variable for each of the uh, different levels of sex. And then this na.rm equals true, that's just removing. Um, um, missing values. Sometimes it'll give you an error that it can't calculate because there's missing values. So see what that gives us. Oh. Okay. So the group by gives us our different um, groups of sex, female, male, and then there were NAs uh, under sex. So it's counting that as a separate group also. And then mean weight, our new summary variable, um, and then the mean for each of these. And then uh, nan, not a number because it couldn't calculate. There was not um, values for this group. Um, and this is the format of this, like technically is a, a tibble DF, a tibble, um, which is a little bit fancier than a data frame in R. Um, so it just gives you this compact output, um, and you don't really see the difference in this sandba sandbox format, but in our studio, it's pretty nice to have a tibble. Um, so that's just noting that. Um, and so we looked at the means for each sex. We can group by multiple different variables. So we can find, um, we can group by sex and species. Uh, and then do the same thing, find the mean weight for each of those combinations of groups. So this gives us, so we still have 
sex and um, it has male and female, but it has every combination of male and female for each of the species IDs and then the mean weight for that. So it's separating out a secondary group. You can see all of those and see that there was a that NA created for this group. Um, I think, uh, oh, this is just talking about the NAN. And so the reason that this appears is because when it's grouping by, it's finding that there's this empty group. So it's it's saying that the combination of NA sex and species ID DM, it's finding that as a group and it's trying to calculate a mean, but there's not enough, there's not data there. So it's giving you NAN, not a number. Um, so that's just why that appears, and we can actually deal with that by filtering out NAs before we group, so it won't find that as a group. So this is just uh, surveys filtered by uh, weights that are not missing, um, and then we group by sex and species ID, and then calculate the means. And if we go to the end there, there's no longer that group popping up. So um, the order matters then, because if you group after that versus before, um, it'll create a group based on that. Um, and then we can continue adding on to our little pipeline here of steps. Um, this is doing the same thing as above, and now we're adding on this print function. Um, and n equals 15 to give us 15 observations. This is sort of like head, where head gives us the first six by default. Um, and this gives you an actual sort of uh, console output, which uh, in our studio, if you're using an R markdown or in the sandbox, it automatically generates these nice tables. Um, but if you have just a script, um, it will print out more rows than that. So this is another way just to get um, be the beginning of the data set so you can see what it looks like. It gives us some information. It's a tibble. Um, how many groups were created? Um, and there's 24 different categories and three variables, sex, species, and mean. Um, that's useful. Um, and once it's grouped, you can use summarize to give you multiple different summary measures. You don't just have to do one at a time. So here we have the same setup, um, the data, filter out NAs, group by sex and species. We have summarize creating the mean weight again. And now in that same summarize function, we just add on minimum weight too, and you can create that summary variable. We can run that. And now you have these two different outputs and you can keep adding on whichever summaries you want for these uh, set of groups. Um, and you don't even have to use the same variable over and over. You could do like, find, but this works, link, and then um, you can rename this to something that makes sense. If you don't give it this name equals, it'll just rename it as the function itself, which sometimes gets confusing or um, full of characters. So now this X is the minimum of hind foot length. So you don't have to use weight throughout all of them. Um, and when you have some of these big uh, summary lists like this, sometimes you want to sort it or arrange it by certain values. So you can have a quick look at um, what the range might be. So same thing as above, we have our mean weight and minimum weight being calculated for our sex and species ID. And now we're adding on a range and we're picking a variable we want to sort it by. So we've got our groups and then um, mean weight and then it's sorting by minimum weight. So four is the lowest value that is for any of these groups. Um, it's sorting by the rows, so four, five, seven, eight, and it keeps increasing, and it just gives you the associated mean weight and sex and species IDs with that smallest minimum weight. Um, you can also have it, instead of increase, you can have it decrease, so you can see the largest values first. So you use the, within a range, you have this 
desend function. And pretty similar, it gives you the same thing, but now it's listed by the, the largest minimum weight. And that decreases. Okay, challenge. Um, so we challenge seven, we want to group by and summarize to find the mean, min, and max hind foot length. Um, for each species, so that was the species ID, and then also add the number of observations. So this is something we haven't seen yet. So the hint is look up what does the function n do. So we'll go ahead and try that, and I'll see if I can put together the same answer. Okay, so hopefully you guys are trying this out. I'm just finishing up my own, see if we can get this. Um, so, so far I've got, we have our survey data, we're filtering out. I guess we want to filter out hind foot length instead of weight because that's what we're doing most of our calculations on. So filter out any NAs under the variable hind foot length. We're grouping by species ID. And then for summarize, we want to calculate the mean, min, and max of hind foot length. Uh, so let's try that first. We, okay. Oh, did I miss one? Um, you've got min of your mean of your hind foot. Oh, I see. Oh, copy paste. That's why there's so, so many parentheses. Okay, try that. Okay, so we have those three. And then for the last one, ask, uh, add the number of observations. So if you look up and type question mark and it'll tell you about this function. So let's call this n, and then if we just do, I think that, okay, great. So just using this n parentheses, there's no arguments. It tells you how many rows. And since we are grouping by species IDs, it's telling you how many rows are in that group. So it gives you the number of observations for each species. So, um, okay. Okay, there's a part two. What was the heaviest animal measured in each year? Uh, I'm gonna check the solution so we can keep going. Um, and this is similar to what we just did, but now we're using weight again. And we're grouping by year, so we have a, uh, a value for each year. Um, and then we're calculating the max weight because we want to know what the heaviest um, observation was. So try this. So the group by gave us each of the years and then summarized by max weight. 
um, we have all of the max weights for per year. And then this select just narrows down our columns to just year and max weight. I think you can remove that and it will still give you the same thing. Yeah. So that's how you can calculate that. Okay. Um, so um, we kind of touched on this, but we can also use uh, counting to do some of these operations. Um, this count function is sort of a shortcut. Um, so this is in the dplyr package. Um, so if we give it our data and then count and pick a variable, let's see what that gives us. So that gives us our sex grouping, female, male, and NA, and then our N for each of those. Um, so you might notice that we could accomplish the same thing by using group by sex and then summarize count with the N that we just learned. And this set of steps gives us the exact same thing. Um, so this count function just condenses all of that down so you don't have to type all of it out because um, it's a very common calculation people want to know. Um, and then the count function also has an argument called sort equals and you can give it true or false and that'll just sort your um, count column. So that would be instead of using a range and it gives you the largest one first. So instead of a range descending, um, so that's all just in one line now. Okay. Um, so you can also, again, you can group by multiple variables. You can also count by multiple variables. So simplify down to this. Um, and you just list out each of the variables you wanted to create combinations of groups. Um, and I just mentioned that you can use a range. Um, so this is, um, you can pick one particular variable to sort by. And so you add on a range to the count function. Um, so we have the groupings of sex and species and the end for each of those. And then we want to arrange it from lowest to largest n on species ID. Oh, uh, descending. So that's actually largest to smallest. Oh. Okay, so now the rows are sorted. Um, we've got our groupings of sex and species. And um, since it's only N is only arranged or sorted on um, species ID, it's within that grouping. So for all of the DM species, it's sorted from largest to smallest. And then you move to the next species ID, DO, and it's largest to smallest. So um, it sorts the sex category within that grouping. Okay. Another, this is a mild green pepper challenge. Um, how many animals were caught in each plot? So plot ID. Um, so I think that means we want to know N and we want to know the N for each of the plot IDs. So let's try that. Okay, so our survey data, and we can just use our count shortcut and look at plot ID. Okay, so here's all of our different plots and the N for those, and that gives us how many animals were caught. So how many observations in each of those? Okay. Uh, do we want to keep going or take a break or? <laughs> maybe keep it going since keep going? a little bit like unless you need a break okay no i'll just keep moving there's a lot of information i know so this is a little bit different for this section so uh and then i have 
you're picking up after this section so you can get a change in presenter. Okay, so we'll just, this isn't too long of a section either. So this is um, now moving on to relational data. Um, so oftentimes you have multiple data sets um, and they're all related to each other. They're all from the same study and they capture different aspects of the study, but you uh, record different things in different data sets. Um, but maybe you want to combine them somehow. Um, so that's where you use relational data. Um, and you want to join them there. Um, so that's, there's different types of joining data sets. So let's see, there's mutating joins, filtering joins and set operations. We're just going to talk about mutating joins and I'll explain that. Um, so let's look at an example. So we've been looking at our survey data set of all these um, little mammals. Um, and they have species IDs and uh, plot IDs. Um, so maybe a related data, data set that we have along with this is we'll call plots and we can use read CSV, load this in. And um, so this related data set has two variables, plot ID and plot type. So it has plot IDs we might've seen. So for each of these, and it tells us what plot type that is. Um, so spec tab, X closure, control, um, so on. So it's sort of a key for what plot ID is. Um, and then we also might have um, species. So similarly, this is like a key for species. So we have all of our species IDs listed. And then we have the corresponding genus, species, and taxa for that. Um, so let's look at this. This is just variable descriptions um, of more specifically what those are. Um, so the variables used to connect pairs of tables or sets of tables are called keys. Uh, so it uniquely identifies an observation in that table. So let's think about um, what the keys might be for each of our data sets we've loaded in so far. Um, so what, what would be the key or ID for our plots data? So that was this one. Any ideas what the plot key is? Uh, it, let's see. I think it's plot ID because it has ID in the name. <laughs> uh, so key is like an ID. So that is our key for the plots data. Um, and then similarly, the key for the species data table, that's this one. Um, what uniquely identifies each of these observations? Um, again, we have them labeled nicely with ID. So I think it's that. So. Um, and then what uniquely identifies everything in the surveys table? Um, this is maybe trickier because plot ID and species ID, which we just saw up here were keys, those are all in the surveys data. But the actual answer is record ID because each of those observations has um, is unique by its record ID. Whereas plot ID and species ID are just information about that record or observation. Um, and so there's multiples of plot one or multiples of species DO. So um, this sort of is the idea behind primary and foreign keys. So uh, the primary key for survey data is the record ID and foreign keys are plot ID and species ID because they are related to these other things, but they're in the other data set. Um, or it depends on which one you're talking about because the, the primary key in this one is species ID um, or the foreign key would then be this species ID, uh, but then they match up. And so you can match up things that correspond across your um, related data sets um, and those are called relations and they might be one-to-one. -one. So for every um, like plot ID might appear in each one just once, or they might be many to one where we saw that in the plots data, the plots data had one plot ID. These were unique, but then there's many instances of that um, in the survey data. So it's a many to one relationship. 
um, and we can tie these together through the keys. Um, so uh, we join data together with joins and mutating joins specifically um, combine variables. Um, so like thinking about that mutate function, how it creates or changes variables, that's um, why we call this a mutating join. And there's a few different types depending on which data you want to keep or match together. Um, so there's an inner join and there's a nice little figure here. Um, so an inner join, uh, if you think of each of these numbers, these colored numbers, that's your IDs that you're matching up on. And inner join only keeps exact matches. Um, so here we're, it, there's a one and a two in both data sets. It's only pulling out those observations to join together. And because there's no uh, match on either side of three and four, it's getting rid of those. Um, and then the opposite of that is an outer join. Um, and there's a few different ways you can do an outer join. So it's still matching on those IDs on um, your X and your Y data set. Um, a left join is prioritizing your X data or whichever one you give it first. Um, and it keeps everything, all your IDs from your X data. And if there's any matches in your Y, it'll join those in. But if something doesn't match, it'll just leave that as an NA or a blank. So that's blank here because there's no four in your data set you're adding in. So that's a left join. Um, a right join is the opposite of that and it prioritizes the data set you're adding in. So um, same thing, it's finding matches um, on ID one and two, and it's keeping four because that's on the, the right data set but there was no match for three, so we're just getting rid of that and that becomes an NA. Um, or the most conservative approach is a full join and it keeps everything from both data sets. And if there's not matches like on three and four, it will just fill in those with NAs. Um, so this keeps everything. And we can try that down here with our three different data sets. Um, so. Um, we start off with our surveys data and we want to do a left join. So it's keeping all the record IDs, all the observations. We're just adding in any information we know from plots and species into that. Um, so starting off with that and left joining in plots, um, these join functions will try to auto detect common variables, but you can tell it specifically. Um, we want to join this by plot ID because that, that it has that in both of them. Um, and then on, once we have those together, oh, we can look at that. So do a left join. And so now we have our record ID. This is all our survey data, our dates. And now um, we can see that it added in the plot type uh, from the plot data set. Um, so now we have this. And, now this is our new data set and to this we're going to left join and add in our species data and it's going to match on the species id from both sets um run that oh. okay all right so now it joined all three together and then glimpse is just giving us all the variables that are now in this giant data set so um through day of week, that was all of our survey data. We added in plot type, and we also added in genus, species, and taxa. So, um, also, if you maybe didn't think ahead and name all your variables or your keys in, in matching names, you can tell it which one should go together. So, use by again, and then you do um, your X or left data set, and then your Y data set, and it's saying that these correspond to the same. Um, uh, ID, um, so you don't have to have the names be perfect. And then that'll join them. And you can also mutate the variable names and just change them. So you don't need to include that either. So, okay. Um, yeah, so that's joining data. Um, any questions before we start making? 
Data wider and longer. All right. <laughs> so we made our data wider by adding in more information, but we can also make our data wider and longer based on the information that we have in our data set. Um, so we might have, or the ideal situation is that we have variables and columns and observations and rows and values in cells. Um, but sometimes we might change our concept of what an observation is and by either um, making things taller or grouping things together. Um, so we had in the surveys data edited, um, our rows were a record that was associated with a particular observation. Um, but let's say instead of comparing records or, or animals that were caught, for this one, for the whole week, I'm going to be for my fat class. I'm just attending with somebody. All right, sorry about that. Um, and so we want to, instead of comparing records, we want to compare the different plots, maybe certain plots or certain plot types because um, they had different characteristics, caught different animals. And so we might want to capture that information. So now we want to create a new table or data frame where the row is values of variables associated with each plot. Um, and um, then we're going to have genus be the names of the column variables and the cells would be the values of the mean weight observed on each plot. So um, let's say that this would be the weight or sex of each um, species associated with this particular plot type. To do that, um, we're going to uh, want to aggregate data together. So we're going to go to the wider version, but here's um, an example of like taking wa uh, wide information and it'll summarize and we can go long. So we have multiple plot IDs, multiple values, and then we can spread it wider where for a particular plot ID, we have um, certain um, information captured in the columns. All right, so let's slow this down to a static picture. Plot wider takes three principal arguments, the data, the columns whose values will become new column names, and then the column whose values will fill the new columns. So in plot wider, we're going to say that we wanna take our names from the genus column. So we want a column for each genus and in the cells, we want the mean weight. And so we're gonna take the names from, from genus and the, mean, the values from mean weight, and we're just going to make it wider. So, we're going to take our data frame, surveys, GW, um, pivot wider. All we have to give it is names from and that variable name and values from and that mean weight, and we should get this nice wide format. So let's try that out. Um, and we actually have to ha create this surveys, GW, so hopefully you know enough information to follow through and how this was done. Um, let's just run the whole thing. So we summarize by um, finding the mean weight. Uh, then we glimpsed to see that we have that um, the setup the way that we were wanting it, plot ID um, with repeats, genus, and then the mean weights. And this is how it looks in the long format. Now let's make this in the wide format. So we're gonna take that surveys GW, we're gonna pivot wider as described above, and let's see what this looks like and see if it looks like the picture. Now, the picture here has um, different species. This was, um, we actually used a subset of all of the data. So they're slightly different species. And so our wider frame doesn't look exactly like the picture, but it's the same general idea. We have species names in the columns and then the mean weights for each plot ID um, for the rest of the data. And there's, uh, we are looking at the head of the data frame, but there's really, there's um, 24 rows for the 24 plots and nine columns for the nine different genuses. Okay. Um, and then uh, we can pivot the combined data that had information about um, year and more plot information. Um, 
And so we want to take the combined data, pivot it to wide format. We want years as columns now instead of genus. Plot ID is rows like we did above. And the number of genera per plot as the values. Um, so we'll need to summarize it before reshaping. And so the number distinct, so the number of distinct um, genuses within each plot is what we want. So uh, I'm going to work on this while you do it. So we're going to start with the combined data. Uh, we're going to uh, summarize it first. So I'm going to just call it combined um, summary and combined. Uh, let's see here. We want um, group by plot ID. And summarize. Num genera. Number distinct. Um, and genera. Let's glimpse that. And genus. Okay. okay. Um, but we actually want this not just by plot ID. We also want it by year so that we can have both of those columns in there. So now we have plot ID year and the number of distinct um, genuses uh, or genera um, within each plot ID. Now we should be able to pivot wider. Combine summary wide, combined summary. And now we want pivot wider. And we want years in the columns. So those are names to names from. And we want our values from num genera, and it'll automatically use whatever is left over as rows. So we need to look at it, combine summary wide, so we can actually see how it looks. So we've got 24 rows for the 24 plot IDs, years as columns, it sorted it in numeric order, and we can see how many different unique um, genera we observed within those plots within those years. So some plots had a lot, of, a lot of variety of species, and some probably the exclosures had fewer species that were observed or genera that were observed. So that's pivoting wider. That's summarizing. We've, we've done this before. We're just thinking more deliberately about it, but we can also take an aggregated table and make it taller, make it um, longer. So we could put year, all the year information in a particular column and then have a column for all the values. So pivot longer takes four principal arguments, the data, the columns that we want to pivot into a single column, the name of the new column that we want to store the names in, and the name of the new column we want to store the data in. And so here, you know, we take our genera and we have to tell it that we want that to go into the genus column and then uh, we want to tell it that we want to take all the data and the cells and put that in the values to column so we have to tell it which columns to act on because we might have more columns in here than we actually want to pivot longer and um, then we have to tell it the name the names that it needs to go into so now because these are objects that are not named we have to put the names in quotes um, and there's different ways that you can tell it which columns that you want to do. 
if there's only one column that you don't want to pivot longer, um, we can use the minus symbol. So we're excluding plot ID, or we could also tell it which column to start with and which column to end with. Or we can tell it we want all the numeric columns or all the categorical columns. So there's lots of different things that we can do. Here in the simplest case, since there's only one column we want to exclude is the minus plot ID. So we're going to take our surveys wide, or I called it um, a much longer name than surveys wide. Um, so I'm going to switch to the using the surveys wide name, pivot longer calls. We're excluding the plot ID column from pivoting. We're going to put um, send the names to the genus column and the values to the mean weight column. And then let's look at our longer version. And so now we've got, we went back to having just three columns. Uh, and this is organized with all of row one first. So all of the columns from um, all the observations from the first row, and then all the observations from the second row. Uh, and this glimpse, we can rearrange it um, in a different order, um, but we can sort it based on the genus if you want. Uh, so let's do this. Uh, here's another way of specifying which columns that we want. We can look at the names. You can actually cut this out here really quick. Names of surveys wide. And um, we can see that the first non plot ID column is um, this genus, which I'm not going to pronounce. Um, and then the last one looks like it might be pronounced sigmodon. Um, so we can um, specify from this species, this genus to this genus. So put that back in there. And we're doing that by, uh, because these are column names, we don't have to put them in quotes. It doesn't hurt if you put them in quotes. And then a colon, meaning from this one to that one, and it's just going to use uh, summarize all of those or pivot all of those columns. Again, names to genus values to mean weight and we're just going to look at the first six rows and um it's doing what we would expect so it's taking that nice wide data set and pivoting it longer and so the next challenge which is kind of spicy is to use the surveys wide genera data set and use pivot longer to pivot into the long format that it was in before so we're undoing our work and a lot of times we do this to catch any kind of data entry errors if things don't um, go into a wide and then back into the long format as we would expect, it's possible that there were some um, data entry errors that we need to resolve or some factors about the data set that we didn't anticipate that we need to adjust for before we do any analysis on it. Um, so let's look at the names that were in the surveys wide genera. So remember it was plot ID and some years. So we wanna take all the years and we want to pivot those longer. And this one is a little, one of the reasons why this is spicy is because these are numbers, but they're also variable names and R generally doesn't like variable names that are numbers. So we have to handle this one a little bit differently. So I'm gonna call this um, surveys why genera long again? And we want to pivot. And we could say calls um, equals minus plot ID. Names to equals year values to num genera and slip it the whole thing. And so that worked because we um just told it to ignore the plot ID column. But if we wanted, if we had more than just plot ID as something that we didn't want to pivot, we would have to 
um, actually use the years. So one way that you can do that is um, you can use back ticks. So that is the tilde without using the shift function, 1996. So that's saying that this is actually a variable and we want to treat it like a variable. Um, and then we can do colon back tick 2002. And notice it was starting to look blue because it was thinking about it as a number and now it should be thinking about it as a variable. And this should look exactly the same. If we take those back ticks off, we can see what the error is. So now it's blue because it thinks it's a number and not a variable. And it says locations 1996 uh, through 2002 don't exist. There are only eight columns. So we don't want that. Um, what if we try quotes instead of back ticks? Let's see if that works. And that also works. Um, so you can use variable names that have spaces in them, start with numbers, and so on. Um, it is not how R likes to work with it, but you can do that. Um, you just have to make sure you either use back checks or quotes to indicate that it's not a standard or R acceptable name. Okay, um, challenge 11, we'll probably only do one of these. Uh, so the combined data set has two measurement columns, hind foot length and weight, and that can make it difficult to do things like look for the relationship between mean values of each measurement per year in different plot types. And so we could, um, we're gonna use pivot longer to create a combined longer data set where we have a column that has measurement in it in a values column that's either hind foot length, length or weight. Um, so we're actually going to be mashing two measurements into the same column, um, and which seems a little bit weird, but we're just gonna work with it for right now. So we want to call this combined longer, and we're gonna start with the combined data set. And then we are going to pivot longer. And we're gonna select our, the columns that we're gonna pivot longer are, we. Um, I don't know quite what order they're in, so I'm gonna use the C for concatenate. And I'm going to then just select time foot length and weight. So this is a way to get non-adjacent columns. Um, and then we want to do names to, let's see here, uh, measurement. And so that will have information about if it's a length or a weight. And we want values to um, uh, values. And then let's look at that. And because it's the full data set, we have to go all the way to the end. So now we see that for each, um, so let's go back to, actually back to the left. We have two rows for um, rec this record ID 23215. Two records for 23216. If we go all the way to the end, we have one row for hind foot length and one row for weight for each of these observations. And then we have the values of each of those. Um, oh, let's go ahead and do this. I'm just going to go ahead and copy the solution though, and we'll talk about it. So now we can get the averages of each measurement. We're gonna take the combined longer, group by year, by plot type, and by measurement. So we're gonna sort of undo that pivot longer, but we did it for a reason. Um, and then we're going to, for each of those um, three combinations, we're gonna get the average measure. And then um, we're going to, um, so let's do this. 
and then let's look at measurement averages. And so we have year, all the years, all the plot types, all the measurement types, and then we have an average of each of those values. And then we can pivot wider again and take this and, and make it more in a cross tab type situation. And let's look at measurement average wide. So now we have one column for hind foot length because we took our names for measurement and we have one column for weight. Um, and so this is just kind of a complicated way of doing something we could have done similar or uh, some in a more simple way. Um, but there are applications for where you'd want to. One of the things that I do is um, if I have a bunch of columns all of the same type and I want to do the same action to them, um, in base R, you would use a for loop. You'd loop through all your columns and do the same action. Um, in, in the tidyverse, um, you can pivot them in a longer format so that say you have a bunch of Likert columns and you want to make all of the fives a missing value, you pivot all of them longer, find all the fives, replace all the fives with an NA, and then pivot back wider. And it's done in like, you know, just a couple lines of code without a for loop. Um, and all this, the same action is applied to all the columns and then it's spread out again. All right. So now we did all of this hard work. Um, we want to save our data out. Um, and um, just like there is a read underscore CSV, there's a write underscore CSV. Um, and all I'm going to add here is that sometimes if I'm writing a script to do a lot of this action, I might want a data folder, but I don't want to create a data folder um, if there's already one that's created, but R doesn't automatically create folders if it can't find them. And so this line of code here, First tests, if a directory data does not exist, it will create one, otherwise it doesn't do anything. So this is not a line of code that will work because we're in the, the um, sandboxes. Um, but if you were doing this in a script, you could copy and paste that and use it. Um, so let's go back to our complete data set. We have our surveys edited. Uh, we're gonna clean it up. So we're gonna remove any rows where miss weight is missing. Remove any rows where hind foot length is missing. Remove any rows where sex is missing. And let's just take a look at this really quick to make sure that this is what we want to keep for um, future use in other scripts or other projects. And um, that looks good. It has the day of the week. It does not. This is not the one that has um, the complete in it. So let's say um, we want to um, count all the species from the complete data set. Um, and only keep the species that have more than 50 observations. So only keeping the most common species or um, the most common um, uh, code that we use in a code uh, in um, qualitative analysis. Um, so we're taking our surveys complete. We're going to filter our species ID based on the species count data frame using the species ID column. So we have species counts dollar sign species ID because we're using that species ID to join up um, and to be used for the species ID filtering. So this is the, um, the subset that only has uh, 50 or more of those in there. Let's look at that really quick. And so we can see that we've got just really common species here. Um, and there's only 10 species that have more than 50 observations. And so we can create the surveys complete and then glimpse that. We only have, or we have 11 columns. We only have 266 records that meet that criteria of those species. Oh, sorry, 11,266 and 11 columns um, that meet those criteria of those um, 10 species. Then write.csv, the first argument is the name of the data frame that you want to save out. And then the second argument is the path. If you created that data folder, folder um, local to where you're at, you would say data slash, and then whatever name you want to give it. I recommend a name that um, is close to the data frame name that you use. A lot of times I'll also put the date on there. So for um, 
research purposes, it really helps to know when a particular object or data frame was created and saved um, for making sure that you're working with the latest one. All right, and let's just really end really quick with a visualization. Um, so we took this average, the measurement average Y. This is a nice summarized Y data frame. We can put a GG plot in there. We can have hind foot length on the X axis, weight on the Y axis. We can color by plot type. Um, GG plot will take either the English or the American spelling of words. So it can take the U out of color and it'll still work. We're going to point uh, plot points and then use theme black and white. And we get a nice pretty scatter plot. Uh, hind foot length by weight colored by plot type. And it does give us a warning that three rows containing missing values or values outside the scale range of geom point were removed. Um, and this is not the one, this is not the one that we cleaned up to remove any of the missings. And so there's still missing values in there. All right, Sarah, do you want to wrap it up? Yes. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks so much for attending. Um, this is in our final workshop in the series, as Ava had said. But we do have, if you go to Montana.edu slash data science slash training. That's it. Um, you can see that we have recordings, videos of our workshops, um, our past workshops, including materials and uh, um, tutorials. And then you will be able to register for workshops next semester. So we're going to offer some of the same, some new ones next semester. So hope to see you there. I'm going to stop the recording.